Hi there, it's Arlen and Elsa Salty, directors of Breakforth Ministries. This summer, we're bringing you some of our most memorable recordings from our Breakforth Journeys trips. Speaking of trips, if you'd like to join Hans, Elsa, and me as we visit the lands of the Bible, please visit BreakforthJourneys.com, where you can grab a free brochure on exciting upcoming tours. Now, listen on in to today's Encore presentation. Hi there, this is Arlen Salty. Thanks so much for joining us today. Hans, Elsa, and I truly appreciate that you're taking the time out of your busy days to grow in your knowledge of the lands of the Bible and to grow deeper in the Word. Each of us has been given a free will from God. You see, we are not robots. God gives us free will. We can choose God and see the blessings, or we can choose our own way and face the natural consequences of walking away from God's wisdom. And today, we travel back in time 3,000 years to learn lessons that Solomon and those who came after him had to learn the hard way because they made the wrong decisions. Let me set the scene for the location we'll be at today. Perhaps when you think of Israel, you only think of desert or the Mediterranean or the rolling hills along the Galilee. But if you head into northern Israel, you come to the Tel Dan Nature Reserve. And here you can walk through verdant, rich forests with cascading waters where the mighty Jordan River actually begins. And once you walk through the forest, you come to the ancient city of Leshem. And then, a little further, you come to the actual location where the golden calf in northern Israel was placed. It's amazing. It is so stirring, and it's also a pretty sobering experience as well. Well, that's where this episode takes place. Our tour group is sitting on stone steps in front of the location where the golden calf actually stood. We've just finished a time of worship, and now our wonderful Swedish leader, Hans, steps up to share a challenging but grace-filled message. I'll be back later to wrap things up and to provide you with another real short tour tip. But for now, listen on in as Pastor Hans shares a message you will not want to miss. So Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for uh, everything that you have given us up till now. Thank you for the places that you have already let us visit, the holy holy, holy sites where you yourself have walked on earth. Thank you so much for the worship here, for the wonderful worship we have time after time again, just bringing us into your presence, Lord. I just thank you so much for that. And now, Lord, we just pray that you would bless us this uh, morning as we have a new day when you want to teach us new things. But first and foremost, you want to come to us with your presence. You want to touch us You want to teach us. You want to bless us. So we pray for that right now, Father. In the name of your blessed Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Okay, my friends. I said a little bit about what place that we have arrived to. A place that not many groups come to. A place where history comes to life. And as I said, after we have been teaching here, you can step up onto the platform and you can look Northway and you are actually looking both today and in those times you are looking over the border of Israel into other areas. Today, Lebanon. So you are at the very tip, the very edge of the Holy Land. The history now about this place. First, we have to tell about the tribe of Dan, right? And we will do that more because we will visit actually their city. And we have lots of ruins left from their city. Ruins actually, I think, from the 8th or 7th century BCE, before Christ. And those are away there. We will do that afterwards. So we will visit that. We will have a fascinating look into a city in Old Testament times. And the tribe of Dan, they came up here because it didn't go very well for them to conquer the land that they were, you can say, allotted to? Yes. Yeah. So they had to conquer new land. And they came up to this city. And now we are back to the times of judges, before King David, before the prophet Samuel. And they came here. And the ruins that we are going to see, those are from like the 8th, 7th century before Christ. But they are standing on a foundation that is a city that was called Leshem or Laish. And that city was owned by another people. 
that lived peacefully in a city of their own. And the tribe of Dan came here and just conquered the city, killed all the inhabitants. And in the times of the book of Judges, they moved here. So this became the very northern edge of Israel, the most northerly tribe, the tribe of Dan, and they came to live here. That's why this area is called Dan. And by the way, that's why the river Jordan is called Jordan. That's two words in Hebrew. Dan is Dan, right? And, and Yered is down from Dan. So the city's name is the city that goes down from the tribe of Dan. And Dan, by the way, if we keep on the Hebrew lesson, that means the Lord is judge or all right belongs to the Lord. So that's the name. Daniel is God has the right or God is the judge. So here was the tribe of Dan. And you know, the King David, he really was the first king that conquered Jerusalem, right? And he brought the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem. And Jerusalem became the center that God had intended it to become for the Jewish people. And this is like a thousand before Christ. After David came King Solomon. And you know what King Solomon prayed for? Wisdom. Wisdom. What was he, what he got? That was a tricky question. I have looked up in Hebrew what he prayed for, and he actually prayed for Shomia Lev. And that means in Hebrew, a listening heart. He prayed for a listening heart. And you know, the heart in, in the biblical perspective is not uh, first and foremost our feelings, right? As we see it in the Western world, right? Heart, that's like romance, you know? <laughs> but the heart in the biblical perspective is the center of the personality, the center of the person. Maybe we should say our will. That is the heart. So Solomon, he prayed a beautiful prayer, you know, just as he had become king, he prayed for a listening heart and he prayed for it in present tense, a heart that would keep on listening to the Lord. And God responded to that prayer, right? He gave him more wisdom than any other person had had. So he was pretty smart and God blessed him. You have this expression, I think, God blessed his socks off, <laughs> right? I mean, Jerusalem became an international center and so much gold and so much riches and so much abundance, right? So everything was just great, except for one thing. Solomon, he had the free will, like you and me. And after a while, he started to turn away, very sad, further and further away from the Lord. Isn't that sad? That's a reminder for us, right? We can be the wisest person on earth, but if we don't keep close to the Lord, right? That's what counts. So anyways... Solomon turned away from the Lord, and that always brings about bad consequences, right? Not only for you yourself. In the Western world, we tend to think in a very individualistic way, but it brings back about bad consequences for lots of people. And if you're a king, bad consequences for a whole nation, right? So a turmoil arose. And when King Solomon had died, the country was split. Two tribes to the south around Jerusalem, they had a king named uh, Rehabiam. And then 10 tribes to the north. And we are standing at the very edge of the north, right? And this was under a king named Jeroboam. And I look into 1 Kings 12, 26. 1 Kings 12, 26. And now, my friends, we are almost 3,000 years back in time. And you are at the site. And we're going to read about this very place now. And it's like this. 1 Kings 12, 26. And... Jeroboam said in his heart, you see the heart again? The things that happen in the heart is the most important things. And Jeroboam said in his heart, now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. If this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold. Is that a good signal? <laughs> calves of gold, kind of, you know, bad signal, right? Yes. I think the name of the Egyptian god is Hathor, right? That is shaped like a calf. So, uh, you know, this was bad influence from the world. He made two calves of gold and said unto them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy God, so Israel, up there. Behold thy God, so Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And he set the one in Bethel and the other put he in Dan. You're here. Wow. History comes to life. 
And this thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one, even unto Dan. All the way up here. Now these actual stones are 200 years later, because uh, another Jeroboam, that was his son, 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 like that, built up the very same building, but it was shaped just like this. And the golden calf was there, so you're at the very right spot, and, and these stones are only 200 years later. So now you know the biblical story, right? And I told you when I had my brief introduction that when I was here for prayer, this was maybe 10 years ago, I just sensed that the Lord wanted me to bring groups here. And I went like, you know, why, Lord? I mean, it's beautiful, isn't it? Yes. Oh, yeah. And, you know, it's the northern edge of Israel. But, you know, this thing, the altar, worshiping golden calves and stuff like that, you know, idol worship. Do we have to talk about that? That's not a problem for us, right? You know, people were kind of stupid, right? 3,000 years ago, they had small golden calves, you know, and worshiped them because they were kind of, you know, you say primitive? Yeah, they were kind of primitive, had idols. Well, let's just reflect on that for a minute or two. And if we go into Exodus chapter 20, we find the Ten Commandments, those who were in the Ark of the Covenant. In Exodus 20, from verse 1, I'll read it to you, the beginning of the Ten Commandments. It goes like this. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. This is how it begins. You know, we have a wrong conception of, of the Torah, which we translate law, and that's a very limited translation. You know, the, the original meaning of the word Torah, that means an arrow. You shoot it a certain direction, and it's supposed to teach you how to live. So, so the word law is a very narrow translation. It's not wrong, but it's so much more than that. And Torah is, first and foremost, something wonderful, right? Because isn't it good that God wants to communicate with us? Yes. So we know how to live. So it starts with grace. You know, it starts with God telling us he brought us out. He brought the Jewish people out of Egypt. Did they deserve it? No, he just did it. You know, this is like salvation. I mean, Jesus died for your sins 2000 years before you were born. You hadn't even prayed about it and he did it for you. See, God is always grace, right? He's holy. Oh, yeah. He has high standards, but he's filled with grace and mercy and compassion and love. And this is the way it is in the Ten Commandments, too. I just want to stress that. But then it goes on. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Remember that one? Yeah. And in the Hebrew, I think it's literally says that you should have no other God on my face. Nothing that is so important for you that it comes in between you and your face relationship eye to eye with the Lord. You get the picture? Yes. And what I think, and I think this might be, you know, something that the Lord wants to remind you about, not in a harsh way, not in a legalistic way, not in a demanding way, not to put you down. You know, the Holy Spirit, one of the things that the Holy Spirit does, according to Jesus, is that he reveals sin because he loves us. He wants us to become more and more like Jesus, right? And we can be so safe and we can rest in his grace. He has died for our sins, right? We don't have to be afraid. And therefore, we can let him also speak tough to us. You know hockey? <laughs> well, you know, no hockey coach in the world only says, you know, nice things to the players, right? Oh, you play so well. You lost with 10-0, but, you know, everything was fine. You, know? <laughs> you see, and we should let the word of God come to us, you know, both with the love and the grace, because that's the most important thing. Oh, embrace it, trust it, rest in it, right? Only by grace can you live every day, right? And the Lord wants to forgive you every day. You can trust in that. But at the same time, just because of that, the Lord also wants to come to you and he wants to come with correction. I don't know about you, but I need correction. I don't know how often you need it. I need it every day. What I think is that every centimeter that we turn away from the Lord, we start to worship something else instead. I'm not talking about us becoming fanatics. I'm not talking about this being a heavy burden. I'm not talking about us living boring lives. I'm not talking about God not being the good giver of all good gifts and that he wants to give us everything that is wonderful in our lives. But what I'm talking about is that if we turn away from the Lord, we will worship something else. And it might be something bad. You know, we know it's a sin. Stealing money, pornography, you know it's a sin, right? But there are good things that might get out of proportion. I was praying in Trondheim one time in Norway. And I 
sens hade Holy Spirit directed me to a museum that was a museum about the royal house of Norway. And I love Norway, but I'm not so maybe interested in the museum about the royal house. But I sense that the Lord wanted me to go there. And when I came there, there were lots of heads in that museum by one wall. And you know, like heads that you have in clothes stores, mannequin heads, you know. Then school kids had been given a task. They were to create crowns for these heads and they had done that. And you know what the question was? It's a question for you and me today, this morning, when we are at this very serious place. The question was, what is king in your life? What is king in your life? One person had a big computer. One kid had a, one kid had a big f- football. And the question that comes to you and me today is, what is king in your life? Just to give you one example from my life. Uh, I love hockey and I went to a hockey game and it went on for you know, two and a half hours and my team won. That wasn't so uh, usual at that time. <laughs> so I was you know, in positive shock. <laughs> and I came home and I was just, you know, I had two pucks in my eyes like this, right? I was thinking about hockey. I was happy. You know, I love hockey. And, and, you know, the Lord had really been there. You know, it had been peace and, and joy. The Lord is so good to us. And I came home and we had a period when me and my two oldest kids, we used to pray evening prayer together for like, uh, oh yeah, 10, 15, 20 minutes. And, and that was a period when we did that. Usually we pray our evening prayers, one in our own rooms, but we did it together then. We had a period of when we did that. We do that every once in a while. And they love it. It's not hard to get them to do it. They love it. I came home and I just wanted more hockey. So the wonderful minister, I just wanted and I hoped that my kids would forget that we were to pray evening prayer. (laughs) Wonderful minister, isn't it? And I was sitting watching, you know, sports. And you know what? Hey, they forgot. They prayed evening prayer by themselves and they went to bed. And you know... This thing that had been so peaceful and filled with joy, all of a sudden it became empty. You recognize that feeling? When it turns into desire and idol worship in a negative way. So I watched all these pages about hockey. You know, hockey, hockey is supposed to be fun, you know, but I just, wow, empty. And the next morning, the Lord just spoke to me in a very loving way, very humble way, very gentle way, but he was very clear about what he wanted to say. Yesterday, my friend, you turned into idol worship. So I think this is the message to you and me today and we are just going to take a brief moment of prayer and I just would ask the Holy Spirit to just speak to you so you won't forget this place you might need to remember it and maybe maybe there are some people here who are like me that you pretty often need to lay down something that is about to become an idol in your life Something that has become for you so important, so big, it fills your thoughts so much, your desires so much, that it's coming in the way between you and your eye contact with Jesus Christ. So let's just stop and reflect. I I just ask you, Holy Spirit, come right now. I thank you that you love us so much. And I pray that you would come to us right now. And I pray that you would just right now in a very loving way. Just touch us. Thank you, Jesus, that you died for us on the cross. Thank you that you love us so much more than we can understand. But I also thank you, Jesus, that you have brought us here because you want to help us. You want to liberate us. You want to deliver us from our idols. So I just pray, Holy Spirit, you would just, as we are silent for a couple of seconds here, I just pray, Holy Spirit, that you would please just reveal if there is anything that is becoming an idol in our life that we need to put down at this very place to you. Give it up to you. If the Lord has revealed it right now to you, you can keep on being in prayer just for a couple more seconds. I think Jesus is just standing in front of you right now. He's, he's looking at you with such deep, profound love. And he's just stretching out his hands, his crucified hands to you, not in an overdramatic way. We're not talking about that, but he's just gently stretching out his hands to you. And he's asking you if you want to put that idol into his hands. If you just want to give it to him. And we know he will give you so much more back. I can sense your presence, Lord. And I thank you that you you are just right now taking whatever we choose to give up to you. So please, Lord, take that into your hands. And Lord, we just pray, forgive us for all our sins, including idol worship. Forgive us right now. And I think Jesus wants to tell you and me, my beloved child, I have died for you on the cross. I forgive you for everything that has been idol worship in your life. And I just want you to walk out from this place with just a new awareness 
a new watchfulness, a new joy that you are just free to have the Lord as the first thing in your life and that he wants to give you all good things. I hope that you are richly blessed by this message from Hans. Perhaps as Hans was speaking, the Holy Spirit was bringing something to mind that the Father would love to deal with. He wants to relieve you of carrying that burden of guilt, shame, or remorse. So first of all, I encourage you to ask God for His forgiveness and strength to overcome this challenge that you've been going through. But we also need to remember that we are a community. We truly can't stand alone. If God has shone his spotlight on an area of your life, I'd also encourage you to share that with someone else who you trust, who can walk alongside of you in loving accountability. Hans, Elsa, and I pray for our listeners. We pray that you'll be brought into the fullness of Christ's image. He truly, truly has the best in mind for each of us. Now, I'd like to remind you that we release a new episode of the Breakforth Journeys podcast twice a month on the first and third Monday morning of the month. So make sure you subscribe on iTunes or your other podcast app so you don't miss any episodes of this inspiring and free virtual tour of the lands of the Bible. Now, every episode I offer a short tour tip to help you journey to the lands of the Bible in the best way possible. Well, we've been asked before when the best time is to visit Israel, and I'll share that with you on another episode. But right now, I'd like to answer another question that's somewhat related to that. When is the worst time to go? (laughs) First of all, any time is a great time. But if there was a time I'd like to avoid, personally, it would be summer. It is usually blistering hot virtually everywhere in Israel, and I'll tell you, walking on those ancient stones that radiate heat even further can wear you down within minutes and just take the joy out of your day. And before you know it, you're absorbing nothing at all. Still, if this is the only time that you can possibly go, then please go anyway and take advantage of every bit of shade and air conditioning you can. Plus, plan on visiting fewer sites if you're going during the summer each day so you can have more enjoyment as you're going to become very weary very fast during the summer if you don't do that. Hans, Elsa, and I would love to invite you to join us on one of our trips to the lands of the Bible. If you're interested, please send us an email to info at breakforthjourneys.com. That's info at breakforthjourneys.com and we'll send you a beautiful brochure filled with stunning photos and all the details of our next trip. Our trips with Hans usually sell out months in advance, so we encourage you to email us today if you're interested. Hans, Elsa, and I want to say that we look forward to meeting you again in our next episode of the Break Forth Journeys podcast as we take you on a virtual tour to the lands of the Bible where the scriptures truly, truly come to life. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Break Forth Journeys podcast. If you've enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review on iTunes. And remember to subscribe so you don't miss our next inspiring episode as we take you to another place in the lands of the Bible. For more information on this show, including links, beautiful photos of the Holy Land, and to learn more about our upcoming trips, head over to BreakForthJourneys.com.